Awesome. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, 2022. We got some new slides to go with that, just to keep it interesting. Uh, we'll kind of follow the typical agenda that we had set up for last year. Um, I did finally remove the introductions because I think we can all just agree that's rough to do here. Um, but uh, anybody, if this is your first meeting, if you ever want to say hi to us or if you just want to hang on for a few minutes at the end with any questions or to kind of meet anybody here you don't know um, from the STARS teams, please feel free to always do that. I got a big announcement today. Um, and then we'll do uh, kind of some of our standard other stuff. And then uh, Doc Laffey was going to talk to you guys for just a couple minutes towards the end and um, either confirm or deny all the news reports we were inundated with at all times. So, uh, so definitely thank you guys for spending a few minutes here with us uh, this morning. And our first uh, big announcement is that we are adding an additional children's hospital to the STARS program. Um, we have a hospital in South Florida, uh, Golisano Children's in Fort Myers, is going to uh, kind of hop on in with us. And uh, we're working on setting up some training and the education material for them to be able to share with their EMS providers and dispatchers and stuff down there. So uh, we're super excited um, and uh, think it's gonna be a pretty cool thing. So you might get to, uh, unfortunately, we're gonna hang out with the, Florida people in the future on this meeting and envy them because those aren't Zoom backgrounds they're using. So, all right, I uh, did have a couple kudos for today. Um, first of all, uh, JPAD, it's actually a little bit delayed, um, but uh, they had an awesome moment uh, where two of their crew members who took care of one of our super brittle stars down there in Jeffco, um, they were transported in and uh, after he got out of the hospital, he got to go say hi to him. And so they had a, a very cool moment with the crew uh, getting to hang out with that kid. Um, I think they managed to get him off his iPad for 39 seconds to take a photo and it was a good moment. Um, I wanted to also give a kudos to uh, an avid Illinois crew. Um, they ran what I consider to be one of the toughest calls in our field or in our careers. Um, they had a pediatric DNR patient or a pediatric patient with advanced directives who passed away during transport. Um, I'm sure we can all immediately agree that that sounds like a super stressful situation, um, but they handled it incredibly well, um, even going into the call uh, on their way to the residents, like calling their hospitals, their medical control, um, trying to come up with a plan of action um, for um, what they were going to do with um, and so uh, they did an amazing job that's a really hard thing to do um, one thing that we learned out of all of it is that um, Abbott actually has standing protocols uh, if you're ever in that event either a pediatric or adult patient their protocol is actually for you to just transport uh, to the closest hospital obviously not uh, doing any resuscitative measures but the actual protocols written now transport to the closest facility where they will um, actually do all the all the time of death and take care of all that stuff, um, which I know instantly all of us Missouri medics are like, well, that sounds really smart because we've all uh, either had horror stories or had uh, coworkers who've had uh, really rough events surrounding that. So I just wanted to give a shout out. That is not an easy call or an easy situation to be in, and uh, they handled it very well. So. All right, a couple numbers here. Um, for December and for 2021. Um, so I think we've kind of found our, our new norm uh, for a while here, at least in the upper 500s uh, or the 500s for as far as uh, users getting in and accessing stars. Um, we had a net gain of seven new stars uh, in December and we kind of held steady at about 791 stars. Um, emergency activations, that's just people getting in and saying, hey, I'm on this plan for an emergency. Uh, we had 37, or I'm sorry, I didn't, oh, sorry, I didn't have Decembers on there. My bad. Marilla, can you help me later? Um, there's the one for uh, December. So we have 55 uh, activations. And then dispatch plans, uh, you can see there, uh, Kim's is uh, definitely earning their overtime up there and uh, just kind of a, a good number of dispatch plans throughout the month. We had a total of 20 stars transports um, for the month of December. The total numbers for 2021, we had 243 uh, stars transports. 
um, and continue to see um, really strong numbers on the direct to tertiary hospitals. So um, those are numbers we're compiling, but as you guys well know, an initiative we're always uh, working on is to try and get these kids to the right destination if at all possible the first time. And then we had uh, three refusals in the month of uh, December, two of those being on the same code uh, continues to be an amazing story. Um, I think it's progressing further. Uh, Gina, do we have anything further as far as emergency home meds being uh, prescribed in the home there? I may have lost Gina to a call. All right, uh, more to come on that. I believe there's talk of what we're doing so well with EMS is working so well, we might just give the drugs to mom and dad in the house to take care of it. So uh, kind of a cool story. And then uh, there are the seven, or, or I'm sorry, the nine new kids that we got uh, and where they came from. So um, training, um, we're continuing to kind of work on the online library. Um, I hate to, hate to say it, but uh, we are kind of slowing down on the out of hospital just for a minute here till we can kind of see what this next COVID wave does. Um, but I do want to emphasize to you, if we have a high risk kid going to your area, especially, um, you know, trach or to an area with no training, um, we are still willing to come out and do that as necessary in person or else we have all of our virtual resources available to us. Um, we'll gladly train with your crews um, on whatever schedule works for them. Um, or if you have a service with lots of people and moving parts, uh, you know, we can always have a recorded training up. Um, we already have some of those up, but um, there are resources available to try and kind of try to handle uh, crew training if you guys need some help with that. So, all right, and Doc Laffey, the floor is yours, sir. So, uh, you guys hear me? Yeah, you're a good, boss. Uh, so there was just kind of questions about what we're dealing with uh, COVID-wise, um, at least over here at Glennon. Um, and I think it's uh, the the numbers we're seeing are high. We're seeing lots and lots of positive COVID cases. The number of actually sick kids is not very high, um, and the the number of hospitalizations remain not terribly high. One thing that's in, that I uh, is important to, to actually, we, we may not know the answer to it when these numbers are quoted like in the papers and that where it says, you know, such and such number of kids are hospitalized with COVID. It's important, it would be very important or it'd be very nice to know how many of those kids have a positive COVID test, just, oh, by the way, they admitted for something else and they're positive COVID. We have quite a few of those kids who are not actually admitted because they're sick with COVID but they got admitted for a surgery or they got admitted for something else and they end up uh, swabbing positive. So I often wonder if those numbers are thrown in with this big increase in hospitalized kids with COVID, that would definitely throw off the numbers because just personally, I just haven't seen very many sick kids, a handful, not none, but the number of actually really kids that we hospitalized sick with COVID it still remains not super, super high. Um, so that's kind of where we are over here. Uh, we're spending gigantic amounts of our time swabbing people. Um, that's like nonstop. We're going to run out of swabs probably at least we're going to start having a hard time finding swabs relatively soon over here because we're going burning through them at an insane pace. So um, what's going to happen then? I, I really don't know. Um, it, you know, but we're in a situ same situation a lot of other places are in too. I heard that Children's is only swabbing symptomatic folks in their ear. I have no idea if that's true. It's one of these here through the grapevine things. We may head that direction here. To be honest with you, I'm not sure it makes a whole lot of difference to be swabbing this people who have symptoms or not symptoms or whoever, everyone's got it, right? I mean, it's, it's incredibly prevalent. So um, we have lots and lots of asymptomatic people are positive. If you're symptomatic and you're negative and you were exposed to somebody, then you have it anyway. I really don't even care what the swab says. You should isolate if you've had close contact. So um, that's kind of where we are. It's, it's a totally, I think, fairly chaotic situation for everybody now, just because the numbers are, are pretty much out of control. I don't know if there's anyone from over on the children's side. 
ER wise that that can give any insight as to what's going on over there. I'm, I'm imagining it's very much the same thing. Probably 25% of our of our visits right now, people just coming in just to get swabbed. And often with nothing else, often entire families. We had six folks, two, two parents and four kids the other day. Um, it's, it's common. I could bring up the board right now. I'd be shocked if there wasn't a half a dozen people down there right now just looking for swabs. So that's kind of where we are. It's, it's, uh, so it's chaotic. It's not great. Any questions about what we're dealing with or how it's going here? I don't believe we currently have any patients in our ICU just with COVID, but I can find that out. Um, are you noticing like changes in the symptoms at all um, with the change in the disease at all? Yeah, you know, I think the there's a lot, and I think people have touched on this. If, if people are, you know, reading in that, it it tends to be more of an upper respiratory than a lower respiratory disease. Again, there's not 100%, but a lot more sore throats and, and uh seeing a fair amount of kids with croup, which I think is interesting. I didn't see as much croup as I, as I did um, with the last wave. Um, so it seems like it's sticking around to more the upper uh, airway and not getting itself down to the lower airway, which is probably, you know, one of the reasons why it may not be quite as virulent because it's not getting down and causing that lower airway disease like previous, uh, previous uh, um, uh, versions of it has been. The other thing is, is we're swabbing so many people with so many random symptoms. It's so prevalent, it's so contagious that just about any, you know, anything from no symptoms at all to any possible symptom can end up being positive to the point I'm not even sure that the symptom that they're complaining of even necessarily is the COVID because the kid before had COVID and didn't have any symptoms at all. So what the hell? That's kind of where we are. It's, it's just, it's, you said it's random and, and chaotic. I don't actually know how any kids are in school today, this very day right now. Everybody's got a runny nose. So. It's, uh, yeah. And then that's the other problem that we're having is, you know, the, the variations on rules of getting back to school and people getting back to work. So, you know, we don't want to, you know, should we be swabbing everybody? Should, you know, you, you want to get folks back to work, right? If they can get back to work, that's good. Um, back to school is good. So it, it puts everyone in a really bad spot. The home tests are not reliable at all. If you're positive with a rapid test at home, you're positive. But if you're negative with a rapid test, uh, it, it doesn't mean a whole heck of a lot. Well, I appreciate all the insight on that. Did anybody else have any questions for Dr. Laffey while we have him here? You're either going to get it or you've already had it. Or maybe you're vac you're one of the folks who got vaccinated and up to date enough that you won't. But I think that's the three categories right now. <laughs> Start at a 22 uplift right there. So. Yeah, exactly. Awesome. So um, that was the content uh, I had put together for today. Um, we are going to try and do, in addition to just kind of our standard format in these meetings, um, I just want to try to give a five to ten minute. Um, just kind of little info sessions on different topics. Um, I know COVID's sort of prevalent right now, but it does affect our kids a lot. Um, we are still seeing it affect the SARS patients too, and, and they're obviously uh, getting tested and testing positive. So um, I thought it was worthwhile introducing that. If you guys ever have any topics um, that you would like for us to address here, just short, simple hitters, you know, like uh, one that always, just some of those questions we always get at the Children's Hospital, you know, like, What's better, dexamethasone or solumedrol or different questions like that? Um, we're happy to answer those. So just email me or text me or whatever, and um, I'll add it to one of the month's things, and we'll see if we can just uh, get a little more information out there in the world for the feeds. Um, is there anything else? Do anybody have any questions at all uh, regarding STARS or uh, anything going on in your guys' neck of the woods? Are you guys running tons of calls and just not telling us about it? Because that would be cool, and then you can just tell me about it. Awesome. I will say some crew's going to get an award this morning. They ran a double stars call. So that's the first time I've seen that, but dispatched for two. So that's the kind of growth I expect this year, guys. All right. We're going to go exponential. We see that comment on there. So Trish had the thing. Uh, Dr. Laffey, do you want to give your uh, elevator speech on cuffed versus uncuffed ET tubes? I know that we're really pushing that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, sorry, I'm, for some reason, I'm not seeing those comments. I can't find my comment there. Um, 
So we're really pushing to, for everyone to switch over to Cuff DT tubes. Um, we've been talking about that for a while. The recommendation is, is to always use a cuff tube. Uh, we don't even stock, we don't even have any uncuffed tubes except for like a 2.5, maybe a 3.0. We could find an uncuffed in the ER. Otherwise, they're all cuffed. So it's exclusively what we use in the ER. Um, for a while, we were saying, you know, that's our recommendation. Um, I think what we're pushing now is, is don't wait until they run out. Don't, you know, next time we need to restock, we'll buy them. I would suggest if, po if at all possible, if it's financially possible, that you get aggressive and actively replace all your tubes with cuff tubes. We've had a, a, a handful of cases where it's, it's uh, required reintubations and uh, that type of thing um, that could have uh, been prevented had a cuff tube been placed. Historically, it's certainly common for folks to put in a little bit too small of a tube in the pediatric patient. That's a comment that's been going on forever. Hey, it's small. The last thing I want to do is find that airway and then have this tube be too big. I can't get in it. So you know what? I'll just cheat down a half a size which is okay, but if you're already underestimated by a half, you know, next thing you know, you get a tube that's really too small and it's got a giant leak. And if you have a cuff on it, you can inflate that cuff and likely you'll be able to continue using that tube. Um, or at least you'll be able to switch it out if necessary at a much more controlled time. But we've had a, we've had a handful where it, um, a cuff tube would have made a, a pretty big difference. So I think that's really the message now is if at all possible, be aggressive about switching them over and not just passively waiting uh, Let's get them switched out. And, and um, uh, you don't even have to inflate them. If you've got a good size tube in and there's no leak, I don't, we don't always inflate the cuff. We just leave them deflated if they're not leaking. But then if they do start leaking, inflate it, you're good to go. And we don't have to make that kind of semi-emergent cuff uh, tube change, which can be pretty stressful. Uh, not to put you on the spot, Doc, but uh, we did have a, a reiteration or a, and ask for the Dex versus Solumedrol. Um, do you have a preference? There's, well, um, there isn't, I, I'm trying to think of a disease where the, the specific type of steroid really makes a difference. And, and there isn't many. I mean, if for asthma, you can use Dex or Solumedrol. For croup, you can use Dex or Solumedrol. You can even, you know, we've talked about steroid bursts, you know, there's ways you can use any of those. And that's something we've talked about trying to, to clarify, but, you know, there are differences as far as the mineral corticoid and, and, and glucocorticoid effects of them. But generally you can probably get away with, with either one of them for most of the stuff that you'd end up treating. It's just a matter of, of dosing. Um, Solumedrol, I don't know, that would probably, if I had to just pick one, it's not as long acting, not that that's a big, a big, big deal, but that's kind of usually our go-to is using solumedrol. Um, dexamethasone is a little bit longer acting. Um, but we've been using a lot of dex just you know, for our asthma patients as well. Some people are switching over to that. But I think it's more of a, there, you know, there certainly are differences, but probably nothing that you couldn't overcome with you know, dosing and that type of thing, as opposed to, boy, this is the good one and you can't use this one. That I can't think of very many instances where that's the case. Cool. Thank you. Hey, Steve, are we seeing much RSV and flu with just everyone focusing on uh, COVID? RSV is, uh, RSV is, is going down, um, which is nice. Uh, uh, just a second. If I can do this real quick. Um, flu, I, I wasn't able, I'm gonna try and bring up these numbers from children's, um, which are kind of handy. Children's, publishes online if anyone ever wants to look. You can go to St. Louis Children's Hospital and there's a section for healthcare professionals and then clinical laboratories and then this virus microbiology data. And they will they publish the results of all their swabs every week. So it's a really nice way to, to uh, SSM does the same thing, but I don't like the way that they put the data out as much as, as the children. So um, yeah, I see, but a lot of times it's not working. Right now it doesn't seem to be working. So RSV is interesting because last year, as you know, we didn't see any RSV or flu at all, like literally zero. The interesting thing with RSV is in during the summertime, we saw this big bump in RSV. So we had this summertime burst of RSV. And that burst has kind of been, so it went way up, it peaked in the summer, and now it's kind of going gradually down. And I think what's happening, what happened is, is all the people who didn't get RSV last winter got it this summer. 
a lot of the people who would have gotten it this winter got it during the summer. And now we're just seeing the kids who are getting it now, like the really little ones who didn't have a chance to get it over the summer, if that makes sense. So it's interesting because the graph, if I could show it to you, um, again, sometimes the link doesn't work. Um, it looks like it's going to just dwindle down right towards the end of a normal RSV season. Flu had bumped up. Let me see where we are here with the flu. Oh, yay. You want to share a screen? Interesting. So yeah, where's my, I don't know why I'm not seeing any of my good stuff here. Can't. Why am I not seeing, I would share my screen if I could get to the stupid part where it lets me share. So anyways, the, the flu numbers right now at, are down actually. We peaked about two weeks ago and it looks like they're heading down. So actually, if this was a normal year with flu and RSV both right now being at a low level, we'd be happy as a clam. We'd be in great shape. This would be like the sweetest, the second sweetest winter to last winter, which was amazing because we didn't see anybody. But actually both our flu and our RSV numbers are not high right now. Um, I apologize. I can't. I have no idea why I am not seeing my normal little. I'll have to double check the settings, Doc. I might have accidentally. No, I can't even find the place where it like requested. You know what I mean? Usually you can like go and say, I want to share the screen and then you have to get it. But for some reason, I'm not, I don't know why. And I can't move this screen off of this screen. Maybe yeah. if I do this, I'm going to disappear. All right, well, uh, Doc works on that. Uh, I thought I'd put this slide together and I was questioning myself when we got to the end, but. Uh, the, apparently it was just a hidden slide. I did want to give a uh, shout out to Collinsville Dispatch for last year. Um, they did come in as the uh, the user that logged in to stars the most. Uh, they actually hit it 361 days, which is an A plus in any classroom in America. So uh, kudos to them. Um, and then coming in uh, hot on their tail was Central County 911. Um, and then I believe Jeffco Dispatch uh, between their two accounts came in at third. So um, just Kudos to them as far as always being ready and just making it part of their workflow to be in and ready to go. And we, uh, we greatly appreciate it. We will have to get some stellar awards headed their way. Awesome. And I can stop my share if you found a doc. <laughs> Sorry, this is. Sorry, too much tea. Sorry, now my. <laughs> I'm going to start seizing now because my. <laughs> All right, try that. Is it? Can you share? It? Does it make it? It's not that big of a deal. I can't do it. All right, you guys see that? Yes, sir. That was last winter. This is flu. Flu A. Last winter, unbelievable, right? Crazy. This was the previous three winters. These are the flu seasons for the, the three winters before last year. And this is the numbers this year. So we started heading up like we were gonna have a real flu season, but it looks like the last couple of weeks we back back down. So we may have already peaked out. As you can see, it doesn't usually drop way down and then get a second spike. You know what I mean? That's relatively uncommon. So our flu is down and we may have already seen, you know, the worst of the flu season. Um, and then let me show you. Uh, RSV if I can. So again, last year, no RSV at all. Crazy, insane, never seen it before. This is normal RSV season. And then we saw this summertime peak, right? We peaked up here in August. And now it's kind of, as you can see, it's going to, it's really going to go right back down. I think we're just dwindling down because there just isn't that we're not, we don't have all, all the people who generally don't get it in the summer and get it in the winter already got it. So we're just kind of dwindling down. So if you just look at our RSV and flu, we're in great shape. This is an event, it's, we're in an amazing position, but the COVID is keeping us busy. But um, it doesn't look like right now we're gonna have that horrible double bump that everyone's always been worried about of having flu like this and COVID and RSV all at the same time. So far that just really, at least the last two years, this year's worse than last year, obviously when we had absolutely none, but you know what? We don't have the same precautions as last year. This is what happens when you are insanely aggressive of viruses. 
And to this year is what's happened when you're pretty darn aggressive about it, you know? So it works. If you want to ever figure out how to control the flu, hey, we know exactly how to do it now. You may not be willing to do it, but it's definitely doable. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing that, Doc. Cool. Well, uh, I and then one other thing, just, just one other thing you're talking about steroids and other things. Um, there's a, a lot of questions come up about using uh, uh, epinephrine for croup, and we're seeing a fair amount of croup. Um, if people are interested, it, it would only be a quick little, you know, if there's some, I maybe mean, I'll put together a couple of, just a page or something on vaponephrine versus epinephrine and dosages. And I said, see, every time we talk about it, there seems to be lots of confusion about um, about what is vaponephrine and what kind of, you know, what, how do I give epinephrine for croup and that type of thing? So it, it's, uh, so anyways, if anyone's interested in that, we can shoot out something in an email or whatever, just kind of clarifying exactly what vaponephrine is and what you can do for croup in the back of the ambulance. Cool, that'd be awesome actually. Uh, cool, well, I have us kind of coming in at towards 9.30. So if anybody else has any questions, um, please feel free to hang on, uh, especially Mr. Tim, if you don't mind hanging, I'll see if I can um, solve the STARS website issue for you. and. Uh, other than that, thank you guys for being here today, and we will look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Thanks, Dick. Thanks, Doc. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.